Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the fifth in a series of five FKMCD OxyTech public educational webinars. Tonight, we'll review 20 years of independent assessment, oversight, and validation. Our panelists are Andrea Leal, Executive Director of the FKMCD. I'm Meredith Fensom, OxyTech's Head of Public Affairs and a Florida native. We have Kevin Gorman, OxyTech's Head of Field Operations, and Nathan Rose, OxyTech's Head of Regulatory Affairs. These webinars are an opportunity to provide information to Florida Keys residents and to provide forums to answer their questions. All webinars are open to everyone. All webinars are recorded and made available for everyone after the event. All questions will be answered. We may group similar questions together. If time runs out, we will accept questions in writing via florida at oxytech.com and questions and answers will be published in writing after the event with links to external resources. You can begin to submit questions now, write them in the Q&A chat, chat box and remember to press send we will not identify who has asked the questions. We want you to feel comfortable and free to ask anything at all that you're curious about. Um, we ask, however, that the questions relate to tonight's topic. If a question is asked that has already been asked and answered uh, live in one of our previous four webinars, we may save that question um, for the Q&A write-up that will be published after the event. Um, we also want to um, just remind everyone that tomorrow evening, the FKMCD Board of Commissioners will meet and will consider uh, an investigational agreement to move forward with this project. So as far as our agenda tonight, we will look at regulatory evaluation internationally then regulatory evaluation at the US federal and state levels. We'll look at independent validation through scientific peer review, independent project evaluation, and then your questions. We'll spend the first half of the webinar on the presentation, so the first 30 minutes, and then the second half, the last half hour, um, will we'll be saved for your questions. Now I'll turn it over to Nathan Rose to begin our presentation. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, good evening, everyone. So we're going to start by just looking at Oxitec's regulatory approvals globally. Uh, and this map gives you a picture of the different places where we've operated and where we've had government regulators giving approval for import of our insects, sometimes for cage trials, and in most cases for open release of Oxitec insects. Um, the purple colored countries uh, are those where we've released our mosquitoes. Um, that includes the Cayman Islands, Panama, Brazil, and Malaysia. We've also had cage mosquito trials in India and Mexico. Uh, we've had our agricultural insects, moths, released in the United States uh, since 2006, and also in Brazil within the last 18 months. And then we've had cage trials of some of Oxitec's other agricultural insects in places like Australia, Greece, Austria, Morocco, and then obviously a lot of research work in the United Kingdom. Um, all of these have been regulated by government regulators who assess biosafety, who assess any potential risks to human health and the environment before they allow the import or the trials of any of Oxitec's insects. And if you want to find out more particularly about the mosquito projects that have been carried out uh, with open field releases, uh, I'd refer you to last week's webinar where we covered that in a lot more detail. Some of the agencies that have been involved in these risk assessments uh, include in the United States, the USDA, uh, and particularly APHIS as part of that, regulating Oxitec's agricultural insect releases, which included moth releases as far back as 2006, and then more recently in New York State in 2017. And then the FDA, which regulated Oxitec's first generation mosquito OX 513A. In other countries, um, in Australia, we are regulated by the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator, which allowed us to carry out cage trials of Oxitec's Mediterranean fruit flies. 
In Brazil, where we've done a lot of work, we are mostly regulated by CTN Bio, which is the National Technical Commission on Biosafety, but also some input from the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, in other countries, in India, the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee regulates our insects. In the Cayman Islands, it's the National Conservation Council, um, and so on. And then we've also had technical assessments carried out of Oxitex insects by the UK government, the, the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee, and then also the French and Dutch governments as well. Moving on, um, just to briefly talk about some of the partners who have also validated Oxitex technology, assessing whether it's worth funding and also whether it's worth actually deploying in the field. On the research side, we've had substantial funding throughout Oxitex history from large research funders. This includes the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who currently fund Oxitex work on malaria mosquitoes. The UK government through its innovation agency, Innovate UK, the largest UK health charity, the Wellcome Trust, and then also the European Union through various funding programs that it's had over the years. Our insect deployments, particularly mosquitoes, always rely on partnering with in-country partners. In many cases, these are governments or government agencies or municipalities. So in Brazil, for example, the cities of Piracicaba and Indaiatuba, which are both near Sao Paulo. In the Cayman Islands, the Mosquito Research and Control Unit. Uh, in Panama, the Gorgas Institute, uh, a very well-known public health institute there. Uh, in the US, the USDA and Cornell University for some of the trials of Oxitex moths. And then various other partners around the world. I'd like to focus for a moment on Brazil because this is where Oxitec has done a lot of work for 10 years releasing mosquitoes, both its first generation OX513A and in the last two years its second generation OX5034, which is what uh, the approvals in Florida relate to and what the project in Florida is for. In 2014, Ox uh, Brazil's national biosafety regulator CTN Bio gave full biosafety approval for the first generation Oxitec mosquito. And that gave the company freedom to release the mosquito anywhere in Brazil without any restrictions. And Oxitec has now released close on a billion of its first generation mosquitoes over 10 years with uh, a very good track record of protecting Brazilian citizens without any adverse effects. Earlier this year, in May, the same biosafety regulator in Brazil gave full biosafety approval for Oxitec's second generation mosquito, OX5034. Again, this has granted the company freedom to release this mosquito anywhere in Brazil without any licenses or restrictions. And in the last two years, we've released about 20 million of these mosquitoes uh, in the city of Indiatuba. And this has protected thousands of people from the Aedes aegypti mosquito, again, without any adverse effects whatsoever. So now moving to the United States, Oxitec mosquitoes in the US are regulated at the federal level by the Environmental Protection Agency. And this regulation happens under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act, known as FIFRA. And as part of its assessments, the EPA considers a very substantial scientific dossier submitted, and I'll go into more details of that on the next slide. They also reviewed about two and a half thousand pages of peer-reviewed scientific literature and also consulted external experts, most notably the CDC, as part of their approval process. The dossiers submitted to the EPA uh, included environmental impact studies, they included human health assessments, they included feeding studies, um, and they also included substantial information on the operating procedures and the planned field trial protocols. At the state level, um, the mosquitoes are regulated as a pesticide by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Again, they considered a dossier with large amounts of scientific information submitted to them. They also considered the EPA's risk assessments following the EPA's approval of the federal EUP, and then again recourse to the scientific peer-reviewed literature. At the local level, oversight happens through the Florida Mosquito Control District, um, who have been involved in project planning, and tomorrow the board will discuss and then vote on a, an investigational agreement related to this project. And all of these lead up to field releases of the OX5034 mosquito. Following successful field projects, um, the mosquito has to go back to the federal regulators, to the EPA. 
for what's called a product registration. And again, a substantial dossier of data, including all of the field data would be submitted and probably also in, uh, introducing and leveraging international data from other places like Brazil where we've released this mosquito. So the Octitech mosquito is regulated at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, there's also oversight. And then finally, before a mosquito can actually be made available commercially, there is another level of federal oversight and approval. I'd also like to point out that the Wolbachia infected mosquitoes, um, which have also been trialed in several parts of the US, are regulated using exactly the same regulatory system and process as the Oxitec mosquitoes. So moving on to the details of what was actually considered by the EPA in their risk assessment. Briefly to give you an outline, this was a 14 month in-depth process. Um, there was exhaustive scientific review of a very large amount of scientific data. From our side, 70 plus documents submitted, 25 commission studies, about four and a half thousand pages of data and scientific peer reviewed literature given to the EPA as part of their assessment. It was also a multi-agency effort, particularly pulling in the CDC to help assess uh, any impact on human health. The EPA process also included a 30 day public comment period where they received substantial input from the public and all of that was taken into consideration in their decision-making process. And the outcome of that public comment and the EPA's responses to it have also been made available on their website. The EPA has published the risk assessments that they carried out for this particular project. These are available on their website and links to that can also be found on the Octitech Florida website. They have also uh, published their reviews of the field trial protocol, something called the Section G, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail later on, so that anyone can look at the plan project and also look at how the agency has considered that and validated the protocols which have been designed. Um, and they have also included their review together with the CDC when they looked at particular aspects of the human health risk assessment. So briefly looking at the data requirements which have been fulfilled by Oxitec, um, this is extensive. On the environmental assessment front, um, potential impacts on fish, birds, mammals, plants, other aquatic invertebrates, other insects, and obviously endangered species. Um, on the health front, assessments of trait penetrance, so validating that no female mosquitoes will be released. Assessments of any potential for oral toxicity, inhalation toxicity, ocular and dermal toxicity assessments of allergenicity, and also assessments of the impact on vector competence. So what will this do to the wild mosquito's ability to transmit disease? Then also substantial characterizations of the mosquito performance. So things like insecticide susceptibility, things like the dose response to tetracyclines, the stability of the genetic traits which have been introduced, some of the field data from Brazil, um, and then other things like screening for arbovirus infection, uh, analysis of the impact of introgression, and then detailed analysis of all of the standard operating procedures involved in making this mosquito and also deploying it in the field. Briefly to summarize the EPA's conclusions on the next three slides, and these are available in full on their website, so I encourage you to read those if you're interested to find out more. The EPA concluded that on the human health front, there is no risk to human health they confirmed that only non-biting males would be released. Um, they also established together with the CDC that there would be no risk of increased vector competence for the wild mosquito population, no risk of spreading antibiotic resistance as a result of releases of Oxitec mosquitoes, something which we've dealt with in some of the past webinars in a lot more detail. And they also confirmed that this is not an experiment on humans. This is an experiment with the local mosquito population only. Together with the CDC, the EPA reviewed the impact of introgressing background genes. This is passing on background genes from the released mosquitoes into the wild mosquito population. And they concluded there was no risk to human health or the environment and no risk of making the wild mosquitoes more vigorous, something called hybrid vigor. Um, they also concluded that there was no risk of added vectorial capacity and no risk of making the wild mosquitoes more resistant to insecticides. Finally, looking at the environmental assessment carrying out, the EPA concluded that Oxitec mosquitoes are safe for wildlife and the environment. No effects on endangered species or critical habitat, whether direct, in other words, if something was to eat an Oxitec mosquito, or indirect, if you were to reduce the population of Aedes aegypti. 
And some of the important conclusions that they reached included the fact that Aedes aegypti is a negligible part of bird, amphibian, or bat diets. And that again, the male mosquitoes released cannot bite people or wildlife. And this assessment also included experiments by third party independent labs, for example, showing that if a fish or other aquatic invertebrate was to eat an Oxytec mosquito, there would be absolutely no adverse effect on that organism. So after the federal approval of the EUP, this was then passed to the Florida state government for approval of the state EUP. This was coordinated by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, but this actually involved multiple Florida state agencies. So this included the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the Bureau of Inspection and Incident Response, the Florida Department of Health, the Bureaus of Agricultural Environmental Laboratories, Chemical Residue Laboratories, and the Bureau of Scientific Evaluation and Technical Assistance, which forms part of FDACS as well. And again, this considered a substantial amount of data, um, as well as the EPA's previously completed risk assessments. And they also looked to get at the field project protocol in detail, and the CDC and EPA's combined independent risk assessment of the male mosquitoes. And again, reach similar conclusions to the EPA that Oxytex mosquitoes are safe for humans, they are safe for wildlife and the environment, and that there is no risk associated with background genetic introgression. So Oxytex mosquitoes over the last 10 years have been through substantial independent oversight by international regulators and by US regulators, uh, both the FDA for the first generation and here the EPA and Florida state regulators for the second generation mosquito. In addition to that, the mosquitoes and Oxitex technology more broadly have undergone extensive scientific peer review. And I'm going to pass over to Kevin to talk about that in more detail. Great. Many thanks, Nathan. Uh, so peer review, that's something that gets mentioned quite a lot. And so what I'd like to do is really just explain the process of peer review and then give some examples of Oxitex exposure in the peer reviewed literature. Um, so the peer review system is a universal system. Uh, it it uh, works around the world and it really is the system that distinguishes uh, journals between popular journals who publish uh, with just editors um, approval. Uh, and those true academic journals that go through this process whereby subject matter experts are used to assess and review publications in conjunction with the editors of the journal uh, in a specific system. And this is that process here. There are hundreds of journals, hundreds and hundreds of journals across all the subjects out there within the academic world. And it's up to the authors to choose the journal that they want to submit their manuscript to. They write the manuscript and then they might choose that journal depending upon the, the potential impact that that journal has. They may choose it on the particular readership that the journal has, uh, knowing that they want to target a particular audience. Once they've submitted uh, that manuscript to the journal of their choice, it's initially reviewed by the editor. Um, that editor uh, makes a, 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 a fairly quick decision to decide whether the manuscript fits the journal whether it's largely appropriate in terms of its content and its, its, its scope. And he may or she may decide to reject the manuscript at that early point. It's a very high rejection rate in some journals, up to about 95% rejection rate uh, over, the, uh, over the, uh, the whole of the process. And some journals are maybe down at the 50 to 60% level. Uh, but it's quite normal for more uh, manuscripts to get rejected and get accepted. Once that editor has decided that it fits the journal and he's willing to send it out to review, he might pass it to a sub-editor or may send it out to reviewers him, him or herself. Those reviewers, I'll come on to how they're selected and what they do in the next slide, but they essentially review that manuscript. There could be two, three, four or five typically of those reviewers who look at that manuscript and decide whether it uh, whether it fits on a number of criteria that, as I mentioned, I'll come to in the next slide. They have several weeks to review that manuscript and then report back to the editor on whether they think that manuscript uh, is worthy of publication. 
it may be that it requires further revision, uh, in which case uh, it goes back to the authors. They rewrite uh, the, the manuscript, uh, tending to those uh, reviewers' comments, and then resubmit the revised manuscript for further review uh, within that process. Typically, that would go back out to the same reviewers, and they, those reviewers would check to see if the manuscript had been improved significantly, or at least to the level of where it could be published. If not, it can be sent back again on, a, on another circle, or it could be rejected. However, if it is decided to be uh, sufficient by the reviewers, then the journal will make a decision on whether it should be published, and that's uh, the editor, who then uh, finally makes that decision to accept. Once that's done, uh, it goes into the production process, and then final publication online, in writing, uh, in print, if you like, or, or, or often both. And these days, there are more and more online journals, and, um, and those older journals, which only have uh, in print uh, articles, are becoming rarer and rarer. So that's the process. Uh, and who are those peer reviewers, and what do they judge? Uh, those peer reviewers need and are scientific experts. Uh, they are selected, not at random, but they are selected intentionally by the journal, by the editors in question, uh, according to their previous scientific record. They have to have relevant publications in the field and be classed as an expert within that subject matter. It can, for those editors, be quite difficult sometimes to find the right re reviewers, and they can search through their databases, which are usually provided by the journal, or they can search the scientific literature themselves and look for specific authors, uh, target them, send them an email, and ask them to review this publication. There are a number of factors that that reviewer then must disclose if he wants to do that review. Uh, if he has competing or she has competing interests, they must be disclosed, and then uh, a different reviewer would be selected. Uh, and not, uh, most reviewers remain anonymous to the authors throughout the process. On rare occasions, particularly where consult consultations required, sometimes reviewers uh, allow for the authors uh, to know who they are and they can have a dialogue. But typically, it's anonymous. And I wanted to point out here that um, not just for the reviewers, but also for the editors, uh, there's no payment here. So um, it's part of a, a, a process which has been around for, for many, many years and hopefully will be to come. Um, and it relies on the goodwill of academics who are coming through the system, uh, pr maturing and progressing to the expert level, uh, providing these services free of charge. So what exactly do they judge? Uh, it depends a little bit on the journal, but typically um, uh, these, these features are consistent throughout. Um, it certainly has to be novel. It can't be, have been published before in any other journal, and it typically can't even be uh, submitted for publication in another journal. Um, it can't be somebody else's work reworked and then republished. It needs to be a novel piece of research. It has to be relevant to the journal in question, and different journals will have a different remit and a different scope, and so uh, it needs to be on topic. And the scientific integrity has to be reviewed, so it needs to be statistically robust, uh, but it also, all the methods and um, uh, ethical standards, etc., must have been adhered to uh, during the production of the data, uh, the analysis of that data, and the interpretation of the data. The interpretation is very important because uh, it's one thing to produce some results uh, and, and have a data set, but how you interpret that data is, is, is key. And the consistency between the results and the interpretation is something uh, that's very important to be, uh, to, to be accurate and, to, and uh, to be real. And then, of course, there's the language, the style uh, of the paper, whether it's engaging enough. Uh, but also, importantly, is the use of references. Uh, the authors should show that they are aware of all the relevant literature and they've used the relevant literature appropriately uh, to, to, to actually reference their own works. Okay, so that's the process, and that's how it's done. 
Um, as I mentioned, it's a universal process. It happens globally, and uh, you can publish in international journals all around the world uh, using that peer-reviewed system. Oxitech have published over 100 peer-reviewed papers now. And uh, it's a very impressive data set, um, which, which, which has been detailed throughout those. And of course, they span right back for about 20 years now, uh, back to the early 2000s. Many of those publications, just five of them uh, demonstrated here, actually relate to the development of uh, mosquito strains. Uh, so different species of mosquitoes or different strains of mosquito belonging to a single species that Oxitec have developed. And those papers detail all sorts of things about their pipeline of development. Uh, so this is typically the laboratory work as I'm, uh, that I'm referencing. And it could be, for example, expression of the marker uh, gene that's in there. It could be um, the expression of the self-limiting gene and uh, the penetrance that Nathan referred to earlier, uh, the, 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 the efficiency of the trait within those insects. There are a whole host of factors which, um, which are described in these publications, uh, which relate to the molecular biology or to the biology of the insects um, and the way that they have been developed. These publications on the technical development have, um, for mosquitoes, have uh, covered Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, Culex quinquefasciatus, and Anopheles stevensi. There are other publications uh, which are in progress. Um, some of the general, if you like, uh, factors that or outcomes that these publications have shown are that not only are they applicable to a range of disease vectors, is this technology applicable to a range of disease vectors, but also uh, that second generation offers advantages over first generation in some cases, and that um, these this technology can be applied to these species uh, with very minimal effects on their fitness. The next series or, or section of publications that I wanted to describe uh, was those relating to biosafety. So the next stage in the process, if you like, uh, once you've developed these strains or once Oxitec have developed these strains is to think about uh, the aspects that the regulators would like to see. Um, and these are particular biosafety aspects or features. So here we're talking about features that might influence their impact on the environment, that might in fact impact uh, on humans or animal health, and they could be related to the way that they're going to be used or the way that they function. So typically this could be um, impact on predators or, or beneficial insects or other uh, wildlife or flora and fauna that they might encounter. Or it could be related to vector competence or other aspects of uh, exposure of these insects uh, to humans. And um, there are biological aspects that are, that are covered also, including things like dispersal and mating behavior, which might influence exactly how they persist in the environment or how effective they are in the environment. So some of the key findings here uh, across all of these uh, insects, um, uh, all these mosquito strains that have been developed by Oxitec, are that the proteins uh, that, are, that, that, that are introduced are non-toxic and non-allergenic, as Nathan was discussing a minute ago. And uh, that there is no persistence. You know, this, this platform of technology um, is self-limiting. It cannot persist in the environment. And so they disappear, uh, anything that, uh, any, uh, modification is rapidly uh, disappearing from the environment once releases stop. And they also confirm the insecticide susceptible nature of all these insect strains, which is a prerequisite uh, for us to develop a strain is that it is insecticide susceptible as the baseline uh, to ensure um, A, that um, uh, we're not introducing exotic resistance genes, uh, but B, also uh, that there's also the possibility of insecticides being used. Uh, on top. So no impact on non-target organisms, no evidence of niche replacement, that's quite important. 
uh, and uh, a publication, a publication and regulatory uh, filings have shown that Aedes albopictus, one that a lot of people tend to think of when they think of Aedes aegypti, because they coexist, is not affected by taking away Aedes aegypti or reducing Aedes aegypti. And no persistence and uh, and and count uh, and a comparable biology to counterparts, uh, the wild types that are out there uh, flying around naturally. Uh, the next uh, section is the field performance. So uh, here we have a, a range of publications which describe um, the use of oxytech insects uh, out in the field, some in contained environments, but most in open environments. And here there are a number of factors uh, that are typically uh, reviewed within these publications. Uh, again, mating and their dispersal and their ability to find and search for mates. Uh, but also the suppression values uh, of populations, the efficacy against particular individual insects, uh, all often uh, published in these publications to demonstrate the, the potential for performance to regulators and, uh, to, and stakeholders alike. These are particularly important publications and uh, because of the requirement for publishing something novel, it's very important to realize that you can't publish every single study. Once a number of studies have been published on a particular subject, then uh, journals don't want to publish anymore because they're not novel. And so that is why sometimes not all of the publications uh, for any particular given product or strain uh, being released in the field are always published. They're not always all published. So the key findings here, um, after seven publications relating to OX513A, Oxytec's first generation, are that strong mating and dispersal um, uh, has been documented. It's operationally viable, uh, produces great effectiveness, uh, high levels of suppression of populations that aren't really achievable with conventional, uh, and conventional tools. This is the list of those uh, publications from the field experiments, and you can see the references there. If you want any of these publications, they're all available, or links to them are available on our website, oxytech.com. Uh, the last section here I wanted to mention was the agricultural pest insects. Uh, we've got a, a lot of uh, data backed up and, and documented to show that this is a technology that can be applied in a whole range of insect species, not just mosquitoes. Um, and, and they include many pests uh, that threaten food security, um, another key area, uh, and another key global challenge. Many of these publications relate to um, progress in moths, which are particularly uh, prevalent in large field crops, and also uh, fruit flies, uh, which um, uh, endanger production of various uh, different types of soft and uh, tree fruits. Again, they cover uh, quite a wide range, mainly through the development and through to contained releases. Key findings here are that, again, we have a second generation uh, technology which is promising and capable of being used in a range of insect species uh, for food security. Uh, that field performance, mainly in cages, uh, in contained studies, has been exceptional, uh, uh, giving uh, population elimination as well as uh, very high levels of, of population suppression and efficacy. And also that the second generation uh, technology that we see and are using in Aedes aegypti and the one proposed uh, for the proposed project in Florida uh, has the ability to dilute insecticide resistant populations and push insecticide susceptibility uh, back in to, uh, to synergize insecticides and make them more useful. You can see here uh, for particular species that have been mentioned, uh, Mediterranean fruit, fruit fly, olive fly, and then the two moths that I mentioned, pink bollworm and diamondback moth. Uh, diamondback moth being the subject of the 2017 releases that Nathan mentioned, and pink bollworm being the 2006 releases in the US uh, that Nathan also alluded to. 
So that's the process, and it gives you an overview of the depth of the publications and the breadth of the publications that Oxitec have released over the past 20 years. And now I'm going to hand over to Andrea, and Andrea will tell you a little bit about the project and the independent validation of that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so the main role of the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District in this potential project is going to be um, oversight and validation. So we are going to be involved in this project um, from start to finish. And the main reason we're looking at this project and others is, is we still are, are needing new solutions. You know, we've got quite a bit in our arsenal currently, um, but it's important for us to continue looking for, you know, the best ways to control these, these particular mosquitoes. Um, this, this whole uh, process, we've been involved with before at the district. So we've evaluated a number of other tools going through the exact same process, you know, starting with an experimental use permit through the EPA, um, getting approvals from the Florida Department of Agriculture, and then being a, a major part of uh, releases, uh, data collection, et cetera. So it is something that the district has done a number of times. Uh, most recently in 2017 with the use of Wabakia, um, that was also an experimental use permit where the district collected all of the data, were involved at every step of the way to really uh, evaluate how these different tools work. So um, we have no commitment other than, um, you know, looking at this. Uh, all of the protocols are set by uh, the EPA and by the Florida Department of Agriculture. So we're really looking at, um, you know, how best to figure out if this is going to work for us. And I say that because, you know, me as the executive director, I really don't have a dog in this fight. Would, would I like this to work? Yes, of course. Um, looking at the data, this looks like uh, a particular solution that could work for us. But, you know, this whole process is really to prove, is this going to work for us in our environment? Um, so uh, that's why we're so involved in every step of the way. Next slide, please. And on top of our involvement, um, again, the protocol design and evaluation is set by the EPA and FDAC. Um, and throughout the entire project, uh, data will be given to them. They're going to assess what's going on. There'll be constant discussions, um, making sure that you know, the protocol is followed and the information is being collected correctly. Um, in addition to that, the CDC has offered their assistance and data evaluation. Um, so I think that that also brings another level of oversight into this. And we will have an independent advisory board um, with Bob Eady with the uh, Monroe County Department of Health, Dr. Doug Mader, a Marathon Vet Hospital, and Dr. Jorge Ray, who is at the um, FMEL laboratory with the University of Florida. So we've got a really great group of people that are going to be involved in this, you know, looking at data, uh, understanding how things are going, um, and then, of course, you know, following that protocol design that uh, is approved by the EPA and FDAC. Um, I think at this point we'll go to Meredith. Oh, sorry, next uh, next slide is uh, our, just a plug for our board meeting. We will have um, an item on the agenda tomorrow, uh, time certain at 5 p.m., and that will be to discuss the investigational agreement with Oxitec. Um, so again, everyone is welcome. You can view that on our website, keysmosquito.org. You can either view the live stream or um, you know, sign up to speak for, during the public comment period. Again, that begins at 5 p.m. Okay, over to you, Meredith. Thank you, Andrea. Everyone, we've received a lot of questions. It's 5.39 p.m. right now, so um, to leave a full 30 minutes for the Q&A, we'll, we'll plan to go over a bit, probably till, till 10 after 6. Um, but we'll start with the first question. And Nathan, this will go to you. The question is, can you summarize again where Oxitex data is? Has the EPA or Oxitec made this data available? Thanks, Meredith. Thanks for that question. Um, so the EPA has made all of its risk assessments 
and all of its reviews of the field trial protocols and also the assessments done together with CDC. All of that is available. Um, the best way to find it is probably to go to the Oxitec's website and follow the links on the Florida page, which will take you to regulations.gov. Um, and there you can find all of these documents which are posted by the EPA on that website. Otherwise, just go to regulations.gov and search for Oxitec and you can also find the documents that way. Thank you, Nathan. Our next question will also go to you, Nathan. And the question is, how do we know that this technology will not be used to pave the path for bioweapons or flying vaccines? Why did the U.S. Defense Department help finance your company? It was not the Department of Health and Human Services. The U.S. military will somehow benefit from this technology. Okay, let me just say categorically up front, this technology has been developed by Oxitec, and Oxitec is privately funded. Um, Oxitec receives some funding for some of its other projects from things like the Gates Foundation related to its work on malaria but this project has been privately funded. There is absolutely no connection to any of these organizations which have been mentioned by this particular question. So I don't think it's worth pursuing that question any further, I'm afraid. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, our next question, uh, Kevin is prepared to answer this, but Andrea, if you'd like to take it, uh, you, you, you may. Says, can you explain why independent evaluation is being done on this project? Is this common for new mosquito control tools to have such, such interest or involvement? Oh, Kevin, I think you're on mute. Uh, thanks, Meredith. Um, I'll take first up, Andrea, and then you can always follow up. Um, I mean, it, it's about transparency, as uh, simple as that. Um, it's about making sure that everybody's got confidence in the data. Um, it's uh, an independent validation for FKMCD, but it's also uh, for the regulators. They would be involved in uh, with, with, with the evaluation of other products too. Um, remember that these data might contribute to potentially a section three or a commercial application in the future, which the regulators would want to evaluate. And so, um, you know, we've also got an independent advisory panel and we have a steering committee, uh, all of which might be associated with, with other products too. Um, but it's really is Oxitex, um, uh, from our side, it's Oxitex uh, wish and mantra, if you like, to, to ensure that there is a solid transparency right across the board. And uh, so for Oxitec, it's not uh, so unusual. And I don't think it's so unusual for other products either. Andrew? Yeah, and I can kind of speak a little bit about some of those other projects. Um, the majority of the time, you're seeing a lot of, um, it's mainly government oversight. So you're seeing EPA involvement, uh, FDAC's involvement, and then ourselves at Mosquito Control. Um, so I think that it's important as any of these new technologies come forward, the more experts we have so to weigh in during uh, these the assessment, either data assessment or protocol assessment, you know, the better it is. And I think that's something that is, is true across all scientific uh, evaluations. You know, you're always looking for, for better ways to evaluate and what, what better way than to involve more experts. Thank you, Andrea and Kevin. This next question, um, Nathan, I'll, I'll send to you and I may follow on uh, with the answer, but the question is, what is Oxitec's response to the EPA receiving 31,179 comments opposed to this technology and merely 56 comments in favor of this technology? Thanks, Meredith. Um, so the first thing to say is that the EPA's public comment period is not a vote. It's not an opportunity to pitch one view against another. It's an opportunity for scientifically reasoned input to be given to the EPA as part of the decision making process. And that is what the EPA responded to when it actually responded to public comments. So I think probably 99% of those 30 odd thousand comments were form letters. In other words, just copy and paste of a particular set of statements. 
EPA did respond to the substance of those statements in their response to public comments, but this was not a question of who voted for and who voted against. Um, any, so in, any substantive issue raised in those public comments, whether for or against, was considered by the EPA in their assessments. Um, some of those issues they disagreed with, some of them they did agree with and incorporated that into their risk assessment process or into the, some of the conditions placed around this particular field project. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Nathan. And I would just add that support for this project and amongst Florida Keys residents um, has, has been and continues to be very strong. And that was demonstrated in the 2016 referendum um, that showed 31 out of 33 Monroe County precincts voting in favor, um, some overwhelmingly so. And um, OxyTech has been consistently and actively engaged in the Keys you know, and, and often in person up until COVID um, for the last decade. And, and we enjoy hearing from, from Keys residents and, and enjoy hearing about their, their support for our project. Um, we'll move on to the next question. And Nathan, this question will go to, to you. This is a long question and it's a, it's a question we've received a few times. Okay, it relates to someone's concerns about a two-page document posted online, but it isn't exactly clear. So we are going to try to read the question and then answer again. Here is the question. Why did OxyTech post a two-page document to represent the EUP application to the epa.gov website during the public comments period? Later, after the approval was announced, 12 documents were posted to the epa.gov website. And I wonder where were these documents during the public comment period? Certainly this speaks to a lack of transparency in the regulatory process. What is your response to this? Okay, yeah, this is a question which has come up a few times um, and we have responded in writing in some of our previous uh, fact sheets for the previous webinars. So please do refer to that if you want a lot more detail. But briefly, when the EPA opens public comment on an EUP, they are required by law to post certain information to the public um, and they complied with the relevant regulations. So the law requires them to post information about the name of the pesticide, the name of the submitter, the purpose of the EUP, the maximum application rate of the pesticide to the field sites, um, the number of treated acres requested for the field project, the duration of the EUP and the location in general terms of the test sites, so state or county level location. So the EPA provided all of that information as part of the call for public comments. And in addition to that, they also provided the public with a summary of the key differences between the first generation of Oxitex mosquitoes, OX513A, and the second generation, OX5034. And I think it's that uh, description of the differences which this particular question is referring to. So that was actually provided above and beyond what was required uh, for the EUP. And the EPA follows the same regulations when it comes to Oxitex mosquitoes, or back here mosquitoes, anything uh, that, is, that is being open for public comment. So when the EPA then opened for public comment, they received a large number of public comments, which we just talked about, and they incorporated these public comments into their review, um, both those that disagreed with them and those that were actually supportive. Um, and the documents which were posted when the approval of the EUP was actually made uh, included the full risk assessments, which the EPA was still working on at the time of the public comment period. It also included the EPA's 150 pages of responses to those public comments and also their uh, analysis of and their comments on the planned field project. So all of those have been posted um, and those are now publicly available. And that's again, standard practice for any kind of EUP, which the EPA carries out. Uh, again, when we get to the later stage of the regulatory process, um, so actually submission of a product registration, um, assuming that Oxitec is able to successfully complete its field projects, then there would be another public comment period at that stage. Um, and at that point, there's obviously more of an opportunity to talk about uh, how well the mosquitoes performed and what impact it's had in the field. So there will be, again, another opportunity for public comment to happen along this whole regulatory process towards a product approval. Thank you, Nathan. 
the next question is for you too. And the question is, Oxitec recently received full biosafety approval in Brazil for this technology after two years and two field trials. Why can't EPA use the full biosafety review that took place in Brazil? So that's a good question. Um, each country conducts its own uh, biosafety reviews of any particular GMO. So the U.S. needs to do that. In this case, the EPA is the relevant regulatory authority at the federal level. And so they require data to be submitted to them following their requirements. And they also require data demonstrating that this particular, in this case, biopesticide is actually effective in the U.S. against mosquitoes in the U.S. They can also consider data from other field locations. So they might consider data from Oxitex Brazil field trials. Um, and they will definitely also consider any data which is in the, the peer-reviewed literature as well. Um, and that can be part of their assessment, but they will definitely conduct their own assessment. And any government around the world will do the same thing. Thanks very much, Nathan. Kevin, the next question will go to you. And the question is, it's two questions relating to Europe. Um, the first is, how does Oxitec answer to the higher standards in the European Union regarding regulation of biotechnology? And then the second question, which is uh, re related, is what happened to Oxitec's olive fly in Spain? Okay, thank you, Meredith, and thank you to who, answered, who asked the question. Uh, I can, I'll take the second part first, and then um, I'll go back to the first part, and maybe we'll allow Nathan to, to bolster me on that one. Uh, in terms of olive fly in Spain, Optitex olive fly in Spain, <clears throat> we withdrew the application. So we put an application in. Uh, there's a statutory timeline in which uh, the regulators uh, have to make a decision or the application has to be uh, processed. And the regulators asked for data sets that we, that we didn't have, you know, specific experiments for them to be carried out, which take uh, several years for, to actually complete the experiments. Uh, so we withdrew the application because um, we, uh, because the timelines uh, couldn't have been adhered to. So that was fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, in terms of uh, the European regulation, I'm not sure you would really say there were higher standards. Uh, certainly there isn't the political will in Europe to use these uh, some aspects of biotechnology. Uh, the standards are high in most places and, and Europe is certainly one of those and the US too. Um, Nathan, would you like to add anything on on, on the particular standards uh, and the level of those standards and uh, in Europe? Yeah, I, I think that they are broadly consistent. Um, mm. They assess the same endpoints when it comes to human health, when it comes to environmental uh, assessments as well. Um, there might be small details which are different between them, but broadly they are the same when they're actually assessing any genetically modified organism, whether it's a plant or whether it's an insect. So I would disagree if, if someone said that the standards are higher um, but I think you're right, there is maybe less political will in certain European countries to actually pursue some of these technologies. Thank you, Kevin and Nathan. So Nathan, this next question will, will go to you. And I just to let the audience know, we're, we're still receiving some of the same questions from a few individuals about, about tetracycline. We have answered these in multiple webinars and, and in our publicly available uh, written documents. Um, but I, I would like to ask Nathan to um, just talk about tetracycline and Oxitex mosquitoes. Uh, one more time, please. Okay, so I, I would particularly refer you to the second webinar in the series where we talked about this in quite a lot of detail. Um, the slides there might be helpful and also the document, the sort of questions and answers that we've released after that. Um, let me talk about this in a few different parts. So firstly, tetracycline will only be used in the United Kingdom to produce female mosquitoes, which lay the eggs that would then be used in Florida to produce male mosquitoes. Those eggs are never in contact with tetracycline. The male mosquitoes, which would be produced in Florida in the field, are never in contact with tetracycline either. Only the female parents, the mothers, and then only at the larval stage of development, uh, not at the pupal stage, not at the adult stage. 
uh, and then certainly the eggs which are laid are not in contact with tetracycline either. The eggs are also uh, treated with hospital grade disinfectants um, as part of their production process and then they are matured and then shipped for deployment. So that's the production process, no tetracycline used in Florida whatsoever. Um, the questions here often relate to whether there is a risk of Oxitec male mosquitoes spreading tetracycline resist bacteria. This is something which has been looked at extensively by the EPA and also by the Florida state regulators. Um, it's also previously been looked at by the FDA in relation to Oxitec's first generation mosquito. And in every single case, this is now nine regulatory agencies when you include all the Florida state agencies have concluded there is no risk of spreading tetracycline resistant bacteria by Oxitex male mosquitoes, um, and that this is simply not an issue at all. Again, other countries have also looked at these questions. Again, in Brazil, where we've received full biosafety approval, the regulators have not considered this to be a risk either. So I would just say to anyone who is still concerned about this, please look at the science. Please look at the explanations which we've provided. Please look at EPA's very extensive discussion of this issue, both in its human health risk assessment also in its response to public comments. Um, and I would just urge you please not to be swayed by what is very clearly fear-mongering here and not a science-driven assessment of this issue. This has been looked at extensively by regulators for many years, and this is not a concern as part of this field trial. Thank you, Nathan. Our next question, Kevin is prepared to answer, and Andrea, you, you may want to add something the, the question is, can you explain how this project will be monitored and reviewed? It sounds like EPA state regulators, the CDC, University of Florida, FKMCD, and the Independent Advisory Board. Can you walk through the role each will play? Yes, we can. Uh, um, so initially, I would say that there's a steering committee uh, that's in the uh, investigational agreement that's uh, available on the FKMCD website that's detailed there. So there's a steering committee which would deal with day-to-day -day operations uh, and that's composed of both FKMCD and Oxutech. Um, then there is an independent advisory panel um, or board um, that's composed of University of Florida, it's also composed of, of Doug Maida, a local veterinary specialist, um, and also the Florida Department of Health um, represented by Bob Eady. Uh, and those three people will be consulted on a regular basis to ensure they can feedback their wisdom and thought and relevance, uh, you know, uh, knowledge of the local communities uh, and entomology as well as health uh, to ensure that the project is stewarded uh, through, its, through its course uh, to the end in the most effective and efficient way possible. So it's really about making sure that that project progresses in an ongoing manner with, with their advice and guidance. When it comes to the CDC, uh, the CDC have uh, promised to offer technical support and ensure uh, that they help us to um, provide a very robust evaluation. Now the CDC have got some world leading vector biologists of course, and it's the vector biology teams that will be helping us. So when it comes to uh, thinking about the interactions in the environment or thinking about data evaluation and ensuring uh, uh, that we have the appropriate statistical backup, um, they will provide uh, an invaluable source of advice and guidance and, uh, and, and oversight. Uh, so that covers uh, those three. Then the, there's the regulators, of course. Um, so the regulators, um, uh, both federal and state regulators are interested and will review the data that comes out of the experiment. But there's also interim reports as well. So uh, FDAX, the, state, the, the Florida State Regulators, for example, uh, will be receiving interim reports uh, so that we can keep them abreast of progress and they will be looking to ensure that there's full compliance of the project right the way throughout. And they also will be receiving reports should there be you know, any um, uh, untoward circumstances um, uh, as, as an ongoing process throughout the project, uh, not just uh, an endpoint review uh, of the data. Andrea, uh, is there anything I missed or that you'd like to add? 
No, I think you covered it all. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Kevin, this next question is going to go to you too. And, and this, is a, this is a question that a few individuals continue to ask, um, but we wanna answer it again. The question is, why did OxyTech hire a lobbyist to pressure the EPA instead of taking a hands-off approach like most science-based companies do? Um, we don't hire lobbyists. Uh, that's just a simple fact. Uh, we don't hire lobbyists. Um, we try and use the scientific data and um, integrity and transparency to prove our point. So we don't hire lobbyists to go and try and persuade uh, you know, branches of the government to give us regulatory approvals or something. The, the, the regulatory process is, uh, is robust. It's not, you're not able to influence it in that manner. Um, so no, it's just not something that we engage in. Thank you, Kevin. Nathan, this next question will go to you. The question is, how did OxyTech coordinate with the U.S. Department of Health, National Institutes of Health, and the CDC in developing their technologies or our technologies? So thanks for that question. Um, in terms of developing this mosquito technology, um, coordination with those particular departments has not happened along the way. But we do have a good relationship with them, particularly with CDC, who are interested in all new vector control tools. Um, as we've mentioned, the CDC will be acting as uh, an additional oversight as part of this particular project, helping to make sure that the data are robustly evaluated um, and that we can understand the results of this project properly. Thank you, Nathan. I'll take the next question. The question is, is it a conflict of interest for Florida Keys Mosquito Control Board Commissioners or staff to own or purchase stock in Oxitec, in Traxon, Presogen. Um, Oxitec is privately owned. It is not possible to own stock in our company and no FKMCD commissioners or staff have made any investment, nor do they have any ownership interest um, in our company. And we, we are unaware of, of, of any conflicts of interest. The next question to you, the question is, why is a living genetically modified insect considered a biopesticide? It doesn't really fit the definition of biopesticide on the epa.gov website. Can you please explain? That's a good question. Um, so briefly, just to talk about what biopesticides are, um, they can be broadly defined as things that are not chemical or conventional pesticides, and that's maybe the best way to class them. Um, the EPA does talk about several major classes of biopesticide on its website. Um, these include biochemical pesticides, microbial pesticides, and something called plant incorporated protectants which are things like uh, insecticidal proteins incorporated into crops. These are not exclusive categories. So these are not the only three categories of biopesticides which exist. So that's the background. Um, the important thing here is that actually the biopesticide in the case of the Oxitec uh, technology is not the mosquito, but it's actually the protein called TTAV, which is produced in the female mosquito. Um, and the genetic material which is required to produce that protein. That's how the, the agency considers this when they, when they look at the technology. So the biopesticide is actually the protein and the gene which produces that protein. And so that falls into the general category of a biochemical pesticide. Similarly, with the Wolbachia infected mosquitoes, it's not the mosquito there which is a biopesticide, but it's actually the Wolbachia bacterium, um, which is classed as a microbial biopesticide in the way that that's regulated. So I hope that helps answer that. Thanks very much, Nathan. And everyone, we've gone over time, but we're going to continue to answer questions until at least 10 after um, the hour. So, so we will keep going with a few of these. Kevin, the next question is for you. And the question is, what is the purpose of your collaboration with the Gates Foundation? 
Yep, uh, that's a great question. That is uh, uh, to eliminate uh, the vectors for malaria and, and get rid of malaria worldwide. That's a Gates Foundation uh, target, and uh, the Gates Foundation are funding uh, the development of two Oxygex species of Anopheles, uh, one for Mesoamerica and one for the Horn of Africa and Asia, so that we can contribute to their efforts to eliminate malaria. Uh, and relieve the suffering that that causes. Thanks very much, Kevin. And the next question uh, could really go to Andrea or, or Kevin. And the question is, who funded the lab in Marathon? Um, it's uh, it's Andrea's lab, and uh, we funded the um, the kitting out of that lab uh, for the purposes of the project. Andrea, would you like to add anything? Yeah, exactly. We had an agreement to allow Oxitec to basically outfit the laboratory, um, but it is STMCD property. And uh, once or if the, if the project occurs, once the project is over, um, everything that is in the laboratory right now will remain STMCD property. Thanks, Gary. I, I think the details of that are in the original investigational agreement as well that was uh, from back in 2016. Thank you, Kevin and Andrea. The next question um, I, I can take, and Andrea, if, you, if you'd like to, to also say anything here, that, that's welcome. But the question is, many local people do not do Zoom meetings. What other methods are you using to inform our community about this project? And for OxyTech, I would just note that COVID is requiring us to take additional and different steps to build on the decade plus of boots on the ground community engagement that, that OxyTech has done in the Florida Keys. Um, during COVID, we have had to move some things like these webinars on, online. They would normally be done in, in person. Um, but the additional steps that we've taken, um, we are on the radio most weeks and we've taken out um, radio ads and full print um, newspaper advertisements to make sure the public is, is aware of these opportunities to obtain information and ask us questions. Um, we were active on our social media accounts and really anyone with an internet browser can, can view um, these webinars either as they're happening or the recordings afterwards. We have ample information available on our oxytech.com slash Florida webpage. Um, I mean, all of the documents that, that Nathan and Kevin have been referencing throughout the evening are, are there. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're doing all we can do. Um, you know, suggestions always welcome if, if, there, if there's more that we could do, but we just, we don't know what that would be. Um, Andrea, anything to add from, from FKMCD? Yeah, just in addition to that, um, should the project get approval, we have a very robust community engagement program that will include going door to door throughout communities, um, you know, making sure that we're talking to everybody that we possibly can. Um, again, COVID puts, uh, you know, a little wrench in the plan, but we definitely want to reach out to everybody by every single means necessary. So if that's, you know, setting up private appointments to talk to individuals um, to where we can do so outside and social distance, um, you know, we, we want to do our best to make sure that people understand and know what's going on. Thank you, Andrea. And and same goes for OxyTech. And I mean, the, the email address that appears on the screen now, I mean, we get questions there and we do set up phone calls and, and we're, we're here and we will be responsive. Um, okay, we'll, we'll keep going with a few more questions. Nathan, this next question I'll send to you. And the question is, um, well, and, and this, this question also addresses a topic that, that a few individuals can continue to raise. The, the question is, many anti-GMO groups are saying this is a Jurassic Park experiment. Can you speak to this? Would negative effects not be seen in the last 10 years of releases? Have any of OxyTech's projects created undesired effects? 
Okay, thanks, Meredith. Um, Anti-GMO groups that say this sort of thing are not basing this assertion on science. Let's be clear about that. Um, Oxitec has carried out a decade of mosquito releases around the world without a single adverse effect. And this has been documented by regulators, as we've talked about today, and also by independent scientists worldwide. We've talked about this today and also in the webinar last week. So I would just again say, let's base our response to this technology and to this project on the scientific evidence which is available and which has been extensively reviewed. Thank you, Nathan. This next question will go to you too, Nathan. And the question is, why is this not considered an experiment on humans when the mosquitoes land on humans? And then the question, sorry, this has multiple parts. It goes on to ask about tests on pregnant women. I guess, would there be tests on pregnant women or have there been um, tests on immunocompromised individuals, children, the elderly, or disabled people? And then the question is, where? Okay. Um Again, I think this is something which we have answered previously, but I just want to make the point very clearly. Oxitec is releasing male mosquitoes, not female mosquitoes. And Oxitec's male mosquitoes, like any male mosquito worldwide, cannot bite. So this is not an experiment on humans in any sense, and this is something which EPA has confirmed and which the Florida state regulators have also confirmed. And there's a, there's a substantial discussion of this in the EPA's response to public comments, which goes into all of the necessary legal basis for that decision, as well as the scientific basis for that decision. Um, so there is absolutely no risk to human health as a result of Oxitec's non-biting male mosquitoes being released. Um, and again, just to reiterate here, I think the real risk in the context of the Florida Keys is dengue and other diseases which are transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. That's what's dangerous to pregnant women or to immunocompromised individuals or to the elderly. Um, and that is what this project and other mosquito control tools are aimed at actually being able to control. So I think it's important that the focus here is on the real concern, which is the diseases transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Thank you, Nathan. And everyone, we have a few more questions, so we're gonna get through those and, and then we'll wrap up this, this webinar. But uh, Nathan, the next question goes to you too. And the question is, why does it appear that so many doctors, scientists, and environmentalists are concerned that your data is incomplete and that you are lying to people about the possible effects? Okay. Um Again, that just simply isn't true. That's an example of misinformation surrounding this project. And I do actually just want to call that out here. There is not a large group of doctors or scientists or environmentalists concerned about this project. Um, and this project, as we've talked about today, has been extensively and very thoroughly reviewed by scientists, by regulators, by government at all levels of the US government. So there is a, a small group of opponents who are opposed to this project and who ignore the facts. Um, and there's also, obviously, as we talked about, anti-GM NGOs, which are also uh, opposing this project. But I think, again, let's focus on the science, which is what has actually guided the regulators who have allowed this project to proceed. Thanks very much, Nathan. This next question, Andrea, I'd like to send to you first, and then Kevin may have some things to add. The question is, this decision was postponed last month due to the board's desire to be mindful of COVID. What has FKMCD and Oxitec done to manage this project in light of COVID? Does the project up for a vote address the board's concerns? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the changes that were made to the agreement now include uh, basically what we're kind of titling a COVID clause. Um, COVID numbers and the local situation will be taken into account prior to any releases. Um, and we've also indicated that releases will not occur until or before January 1st of 2021. So um, we are definitely... Uh, 
very aware of the situation that's going on currently, and uh, I know that the board was very concerned about that at our last meeting. So uh, we feel like we've now addressed that in the upcoming agreement. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, <clears throat> nothing to add from me, Meredith, on that. I think that was uh, comprehensive. Great. Thank you both. And last question, Andrea, we'll send this one to you too. Where can we see the investigational agreement? Uh, so the investigational agreement was posted to our website last Thursday. You can find it at keysmosquito.org. If you go to the board meeting uh, page, you'll find backup information and it is listed there on um, the entire agenda and all backup information is, is on that website. Thank you, Andrea. So this is the end of our questions. Andrea, would you like to say anything else before we wrap up? Um, no, I, I think I just want to, again, reiterate that this technology is, is something that we're interested in testing, you know, similar to other technologies that we've recently been testing. Um, and, you know, we're going through the process in the same exact way as we've done with other projects previously. So, um, you know, I, I'm interested to know, will this work for us here? And, and that's what the trial is. You know, we've seen the, the information that's been published in other places, but the question remains, will this work for us in the Florida Keys? And, you know, if we find these projects really helping us reduce these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, you know, it's definitely something that, that we're looking for. So, um, you know, just to, again, reiterate, we, we will be involved every step of the way. You know, I want to see the data. I know all of the scientists on my staff want to see the data. We want to be involved in the project, uh, again, at, at every single step to make sure that it's happening the right way and that we are, you know, involved in that, in that data collection. Thank you, Andrea. Kevin, Nathan, anything to add before we wrap up? Uh, just a thank you uh, for everybody who participated. Um, I think it was a lively discussion at the end there. Some great questions, so, some some slightly off the wall questions, but there's some really good ones mixed in there too. So uh, thanks for everybody's participation. Yeah, just to say thank you as well. Great. Thank you all. And with that, good night. <laughs>